Good morning, everyone. Okay. Are you? Okay. Um, this one. Hello, check. Good, thank you. Okay, good morning. Uh, we'll just begin with a word of prayer. Would anyone be willing to open us in prayer? <laughs> Father God, we thank you for this time, for this class. And uh, when we came together, you lead us, guide us through your Holy Spirit, Father. When ma'am will be teaching, you guide her by your Holy Spirit. We submit ourselves into your hand, Father. We submit this class into your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. So um, we'll go into today's content. Uh, Sean was supposed to present, but he hasn't logged in online. So we'll just see if he comes, he can do it, or we'll uh, just let me know if he comes in, because I'll be sharing screen. I may not know that he's joined the class. Okay, uh, Shiv Kumar, uh, who are you presenting on? John Hyde, madam. John Hyde, is it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, let me just check. I think I had uh, changed your date to tomorrow. Okay, um, madam. Is tomorrow okay with you? Fine, madam, not a problem. Okay. Uh, let me just make sure that's right, because I think I only had Sean for today's presentation. Yeah, I think uh, your name, I, I changed the date to tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll have uh, Rin, um, Nikhil, Anthony. Is Anthony here? OK, Anthony will present tomorrow as well. And uh, Ravli is also tomorrow. So we have five presentations. So pretty much, I think, uh, maybe we'll just start with the presentations tomorrow. Tira, uh, yours is on October 3rd, so next week, um, Tuesday. Monday, we won't have class. Monday is a holiday. So on Tuesday next week. Your date, is it? Yes, yeah. So the uh, Prince Nina Santosh and uh, Anchira are on October 3rd. OK. 
Um, so today it's just Sean if he joins us. Okay, so we won't uh, do an overview of last week's content. We'll just go into this week's content. I don't think we covered uh, this. Uh, we, I don't think we covered the Scottish revival, so we'll start from there. Uh, everyone's able to see screen my screen, right? We'll just go from there. So 1830, we've reached all the way from, uh, yeah, the first century to the 19th century now. Uh, so we're looking at a revival that started in Scotland. So this is post the Second Great Awakening that happened in North America and spread from North America to various uh, parts of the world. Um, in 1830, so the Second Great Awakening ended in about 1814. And uh, about 16 years after that uh, is when the Scottish revival broke out. So. In 1822, uh, there was a Presbyterian minister named Edward, Edward Irving, um, and he uh, was leading the Church of Scotland. So um, he started uh, to read the Book of Acts. And as he was reading the Book of Acts, he was challenged by the accounts that he was reading there of the Holy Spirit moving, uh, everything that we covered in Acts, right, of how uh, the Holy Spirit was moving in the early church. So he looked at that and he recognized that that was something that was seen in the church and should never have stopped in the church because there is nothing in scripture that teaches that uh, the gifts were removed from the church. So he started to talk to his congregation about uh, seeing that as the normal outworking of the church. This is the way we should be uh, experiencing the Holy Spirit's move amongst us. Um, and as he uh, did that, they started to see manifestations of uh, the gifts of the Spirit amongst them. So they started seeing tongues, prophecy, healings happen within their church gatherings. Uh, and membership grew uh, multiplied so just from 50 members to 1000 members uh, through his preaching uh, th so this is even before he started uh, preaching from acts that membership grew and then he started preaching and uh, he was basically a gifted preacher but because of his encouragement of spiritual gifts uh, they started seeing that also uh, being displayed in the church so there's an account of uh, some women in the church. There was uh, a woman named Mary Campbell, and um, she started to speak in tongues in March 1830. That's one of the few first accounts of them seeing spiritual gifts. Uh, the next month, there was another uh, woman named Margaret who prophesied and said that there was going to be a baptism of the Spirit uh, that day over the church. Um, they both knew each other and both of them were actually sick. Um, but Margaret, the second lady who uh, prophesied, she told her brother about the Holy Spirit and prayed for him. And he started to speak in tongues. Uh, and then he went and prayed for her to be healed. And when he prayed, she was healed immediately. Um, so he wrote a letter about her healing to the first lady who spoke in tongues, Mary. And just by reading that letter, as she was reading the letter, she was healed. Uh, so that's how uh, the Holy Spirit started to move among them. And so it was something that couldn't be disputed by people as something that they were just making up because there was evidence of healing. There was evidence of the gifts uh, among them. Um, but Edward Irving started to preach about Christ's humanity. So he was emphasizing that he was not saying that Christ was not uh, divine. He was saying Christ was divine, but he was fully human when he was on earth. And everything he did was by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he started to teach this. And um, the church basically felt that what he was teaching was wrong because he was talking so much about Christ's humanity. Uh, so he also said that um, Christ 
could have sinned, but because of the Holy Spirit in him, he didn't sin. So that was viewed as wrong teaching to say that God could sin. Uh, and so they uh, basically called him a heretic and he was thrown out of the church. He was not allowed to continue his work. So he went outside and started, he continued to work outside of the Church of Scotland. Uh, and many people from the church continued to follow his leadership. Uh, but there was a lot of problem within the church leadership uh, because he believed in the apostles, uh, the prophets, so all of those roles, the teachers, uh, pastors within the church, and he believed that the prophets had a position above the pastors. So he himself was a pastor, so he started to follow the leading of those who had been designated as prophets within the church. Uh, he lost his own position of leadership, and then because there was so much division and fighting the church, wrong leadership from the prophets, uh, all of those things, the church finally kind of uh, fell apart and the work didn't continue. But he had a huge impact on kind of uh, seeing spiritual gifts being revealed in the church. Um, <clears throat> four years later, we moved to Germany. Um, and there was an organization called the Basel Mission. So Basel is a place in Germany. Has anyone heard of the Basel Mission? No? Basel Mission from Germany? No, okay. So Basel Mission actually had a huge impact of, on India, okay? Uh, so it was founded in 1815 and uh, first was starting to train British and Dutch uh, missionaries that were part of mission societies, but after some time started to raise up missionaries and send them out um, and established centers around the world. Uh, but they did a lot of like, apart from missions work of taking the gospel, uh, so apart from evangelism, they did a lot of local work. Uh, so they created printing presses, they did work where they were weaving things, they created tiles. So they had uh, factories that made tiles for houses. Um, and they did also medical missionary work. Um, so actually, the Basin Mission came to South India, to uh, the coastal part of South India. I don't know if I have that. No, I don't have it on the map. Uh, but they are uh, in what is called the Malabar coast. So um, near Mangalore, Kerala, uh, all of those parts. So I'm kind of a product of the Basel Mission uh, because we are from Mangalore. Uh, so we still are part of, technically part of the Basel Mission, like Christian group from Mangalore. Um, so it was a huge, uh, basically they sent missionaries all around the world, uh, in India, China, Cameroon, uh, so different parts of Africa, Nigeria, Borneo, Latin America, uh, Sudan, so lots of uh, different places all around the world. Uh, so missionaries that were from Germany. Um, but their huge impact was not only on missions, because they had these organizations, they actually supported a lot of like building employment, uh, supporting the work that they were doing. Um, but on the other hand, they also got distracted from their missions because they had all these businesses. So a lot of it uh, kind of became more about money making and uh, profit in business rather than continuing their missions work. So that was one downfall. Uh, move on 1835 to 1840. Um, so this is revival that happened in Hawaii. If you can see on the map, Hawaii is uh, yeah near North America, between North America and China, uh, an island, so a group of islands there. Uh, there was someone named Titus Cohen. Uh, he was a preacher. And he became a believer during the Second Great Awakening. So when, while he was in America, while the Second Great Awakening was happening, he became a believer. And um, about 20 years later, he went to Hawaii to the Hilo Island um, and started to preach and teach among the people there. Uh, two years later, two years after he started to preach, um, there was sparks of revival that started. And uh, it was a huge revival. There were 
15,000 people who, who started to attend the church. Um, in one, they started a two year camp meeting. When that revival began, they started. Uh, so, camp meetings were outdoor camp meetings. They would meet in open fields. People would come and stay there and listen to preachers throughout the day. Uh, they would live in like uh, movable like tents or in uh, some kind of movable housing. Um, so they started something that went on for two years. And every day there were two to 3,000 people present at those meetings for two years. Uh, so that was the extent, that was the impact of the revival. Uh, the largest congregation at that time was formed in this tiny island. Um, and from this, there were 60 uh, self-supporting churches that were formed. Uh, native pastors leading all of these churches, 15,000 uh, people attending the churches. And by the end of it, 70% of that island had come to Christ. Uh, so that is a huge impact for such a large group of people to turn to Christ. So uh, all of these people would have been from the native uh would have been like native tribals, all of that. So from that faith, they came to faith in Christ. Okay, 1836, uh, George Muller was a German Christian, uh, and he moved to England from Germany and began to take care of uh, poor girls specifically. So uh, he first started to take care of 30 girls in their own house. They had 30 girls living with them and they were taking care of them. Um, but as it grew uh, to a much larger number, they established an orphanage with 10,000 uh, children. Uh, this here they had um, both boys and girls, but was mostly girls still. Uh, who were there. And then 117 Christian schools were established with over 120,000 children. So most of these children, again, were orphans. So they were educating uh, the poorer children and educating orphans. Um, so the biggest thing about George Muller is that he never did any fundraising. Uh, he always believed in just trusting God for provision. Um, so there's a story where they were they would all gathered for breakfast and they all prayed and thanked God for breakfast, but actually there was no food. Uh, they didn't have any food there to give the children. Uh, and while uh, once they prayed, uh, the baker came because came and knocked on the door. They heard a knock on the door. They went and opened the door, and he had felt led the previous night to bake extra bread uh, and bring it to them. And so he brings the bread. And while he bring when he brings the bread in. Uh, they hear another knock on the door and they go out and the milkman's cart has broken down outside uh, their orphanage and he didn't want all the milk to go bad so he gives them all his milk and their breakfast is there so that's just one example of how they saw god provide as they trusted in him um, that they didn't go out trying to get people support them not they didn't go out and share their needs with people they simply prayed and uh, kept trusting that God would provide uh, each time that they needed. Um, so there's a quote from George Muller here. I've joyfully dedicated my whole life to the object of exemplifying how much may be accomplished by prayer and faith. Um, to, so to say that um, that was all he was going to do. He was just going to pray and believe. And uh, whatever he was able to do in life would be the result of that. And that would show how uh, powerful prayer and faith is. Um, so yeah, that's a very challenging thing. I think when you know that you can get support, right? You can, there are people who would be willing to support your work, um, but choose not to go out and ask for money, not to share your needs with people to just trust with so many people depending on you. It's not just for you or your family. It's for so many children uh, to believe God for that kind of provision is an amazing thing. Um, 1839, uh, there's a missionary named William 
Chalmers Burns. So he was from Scotland. Uh, and he was from actually a family where his, uh, his dad was a pastor. And he grew up definitely in the faith. Um, but he never felt called to ministry. His dad wanted him to go into ministry, but that was he hadn't even like been converted. So in 1831 is when he actually uh, he came to faith in Christ. And when he came to faith in Christ, he felt called to ministry. Uh, so he left what he was doing to be trained uh, to go as a missionary. And uh, 1839, he was called to preach in his pastors in his father's church. So his hometown was uh, called Kilsith. And uh, he was supposed to just go there and preach for a few weeks. But when he was preaching there, there was such a great response. There was like the Holy Spirit was moving as he was preaching. People were responding uh, in like they were responding in conviction. Uh, they were wanting God to move. There was repentance. There was uh, like a desire to redevote themselves to God. And uh, so as he was preaching, he recognized that this was something that was the Holy Spirit. It was not him. Uh, he uh, would constantly talk about this is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, and pray that God himself would convert them uh, and bring them to Christ. He spent many, many hours in prayer, um, asking God to use him, asking God to bless others through him. Um, and so through this, uh, revival started to spread across Scotland through his preaching. Um, he uh, then went to British Hong Kong in 1847. So although he was preaching here, he had a burden for China, uh, even while he was being trained, even as he was preaching, he always wanted to go out on missions. And so 1847, he went to British Hong Kong. Um, and in 1855 is when he met Hudson Taylor. Uh, so Hudson Taylor, maybe most of you have heard of him, but he considered uh, William Burns to be his spiritual mentor. Uh, so he had such a great impact on him. Uh, and after 20 years of serving in China, he passed away in 1868. Um, okay, is Sean here? Because David Livingston is the next. No, he's not here, no? He wasn't there. OK. So we'll just skip David Livingston. And if he joins us tomorrow, maybe we can, um, he can present. Um, and so 1841 was when David Livingston went as a missionary to Africa. And uh, also the German Evangelical Lutheran mission was formed. Uh, so this was a mission society from Germany, uh, from the Lutheran Church specifically, and sent missionaries to other parts, to many parts of the world. Um, so now we go to Hudson Taylor. We just talked about him, uh, a missionary to China. So at age 21, uh, so he's really young, he moved to China as a missionary. Uh, so he was. Uh, from England, so an Englishman. But as soon as he moved to China, he felt it necessary to uh, adopt Chinese culture. So he uh, started to uh, wear Chinese clothes. He tied his hair in uh, what is called a pigtail, so like a small braid. Um, but what he was doing was very different from the other missionaries, right? There were missionaries who'd been there for years, who'd been working there, and they had not done that. So for this new young missionary to come in and uh, suddenly adopt all of these cultural practices was very strange for them. So they started to ridicule what he was doing. Um, so in a way, he was a bit ostracized from the larger missionary community because of that. Um, so he had a huge burden to go into inland China, uh, although he arrived uh, on the coast, in his desire was to go preach in the center of China. And immediately after arriving, within a year uh, of learning the language and all that, he started to move inland to preach uh, to the Chinese people there. Um, 
so he was very very disciplined very hard working sacrificed a lot for uh, the missions work that he was called to um, but he also um, was physically unwell so he had to return uh, to england to get treatment and while he was there he founded the china inland mission um, so he'd already become an independent missionary because the organization that had sent him was not well uh, kind of operated they ran out of funds there was no support that he was receiving and he started to serve independently when he went back to england he founded the china inland mission although he was sick and recovering and receiving treatment he started to recruit missionaries uh, to uh, join him in the work and uh, he had very specific uh, things that he was asking from uh, the people there one of which was that they would have to wear chinese clothes they would have to uh, kind of adopt the culture there uh, and the other was to go into the inlands to uh, to preach to the people on the insides, not only on the coastal areas, which was where a lot of the missions was already happening. Um, so he recruited a lot of people, and uh, this uh, the missions group grew and multiplied very, very quickly uh, within a short period of time. Uh, they did some amazing work, and Hudson Taylor is known because of all the work that he did, uh, the impact that he had, the people he inspired, the sacrifices he made. Um, but he also did it to an extent where he himself uh, got sick and uh, could not continue the work that he was doing. Uh, so he says, China, this is a quote from him, China is not to be won for Christ by quiet, ease-loving men and women. The stamp of men and women we need is such as will put Jesus, China, and souls first and foremost in everything, and at every time, even life itself must be secondary. Um, so that was the way he did his missions work uh, with a lot of sacrifice and expecting that from the missionaries who joined him as well. Uh, so this is a really nice presentation I found um, uh, that I've just put a link to here. I'll just share it on the classroom as well. Uh, that gives more detail about Hudson Taylor's life. Uh, okay, so 1853, um, we move on to someone named John Nevius. Uh, he was from America and he was a Presbyterian uh, from the Presbyterian Church. He also went to China in 1853. So he did, uh, uh, so travel was primarily by ship, right, to China. So six month travel to China. Um, and he learned Chinese within a year. Uh, he had a very um, systematic way of working. So uh, June to August every year, he would have Bible studies in his house with 30 to 40 uh, people who would be coming to his house, men uh, specifically, that he would be training uh, so it was like a mini seminary June to August every year. Um, the rest of the year, he would be traveling throughout China on horseback. He would go visit churches. Uh, he would teach. He would disciple people. Um, he had a lot of content that he had written. So he, uh, all of this on uh, Bible study methods, how do you pray, the Apostles' Creed, scripture passages that needed to be memorized, uh, rules and regulations for believers. So he was very uh, orderly, very systematic about his faith and about the way the church should function. So that's what he was taking to these churches as he was going there, uh, kind of overseeing what was happening, what was the order they were following, uh, how was the church functioning, and also teaching and helping people grow in their faith. Um, so he also had this, uh, like a systematic Bible study. That was the group that he was meeting with. Uh, he emphasized something called as church self-governance and discipline. Uh, so this was actually a huge impact. So it's, uh, it's now called the Nevius method. And it's something that was adopted by the Korean church. Uh, why it was so important is that at this time, 
all of the missionaries who were going there were supported by their sending organization. And then they would raise up local uh, pastors and leaders. And those local pastors and leaders were still being supported by the missionary organization that had sent uh, the missionaries. So the problem was there was a lot of foreign funding, um, which he felt was making uh, the local people very dependent on outside funding. Uh, it was also a way for the foreigners to still control what was happening in the church, in the local church. Uh, it was also um, something that kind of kept them from depending on God because they knew where their money was coming from. They didn't have to uh, like ever depend on God providing for them. It was all dependence on these missionaries, on their sending organizations, on these foreign funds that were coming in. So he started to emphasize that local leaders be raised and that they continue in whatever work they were doing. So if they were uh, working in some secular outside position, they continue working in those roles and they serve as ministers in the church. But if the church themselves wanted to start supporting these pastors, that was up to the church. So that did two things. One thing was it um, made churches themselves decide that they were going to fund their uh, spiritual leaders. They were going to support their spiritual leaders. It made them take ownership of the work that was being done. The second thing was that these leaders were continuing to be in the marketplace. So they're continuing to evangelize wherever they were. So that was like the church would grow through their presence in the marketplace, um, which was something, again, that was not happening uh, church growth was not happening by evangelism continuing in that way. Uh, so those were some of the big things that he impacted in the church. And this is something that started to be adopted uh, in churches outside of China as well. OK, so how are we doing on time? Sorry, I don't have my phone with me. So I... OK, OK, just let me know when we are at close to the end. Uh, OK, so 1857 to 58 is uh, when the layman's prayer revival started in New York. We talked about this, I think, in our first class briefly. Um, and we look at it in the next chapter. But um, this is known as the most widespread revival. And what is amazing about it is that it was not led by any like big pastors, leaders, preachers. It was uh, the common, just everyday people, congregation attending church who started to meet for prayer. So it started with a small group of people in New York uh, who met for prayer during their lunchtime from work. So they had a break at work. They had lunchtime. They would meet and pray. Uh, from six people meeting for prayer, it grew to 10,000 people meeting. Uh, during a weekday, during their work day, uh, in the lunchtime. So it was uh, where these people saw an opportunity, right? They saw that, OK, we're all at work. We all have a break time. This is an opportunity for us to gather and pray. And we're going to use that opportunity. It was just a very simple thing. Um, but God moved powerfully through it for that group to increase in that way. Uh, within two years, uh, there were 1 million people converted. So 1 million people came to Christ just from people meeting at lunch for prayer. And uh, 1 million people within the church uh, were restored to faith. So there was revival uh, that happened within the church. And this actually spread all over, not only all over America, but uh, all over the world. So to uh, Europe, in Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Britain, Germany, Sweden, Netherlands, then outside of Europe to the West Indies, to South Africa, to Indonesia. OK, so just this thing of lay people uh, meeting to pray, uh, that thing spread to all of these places. So uh, this is one of the accounts of how it spread from New York. It spread to Northern Ireland. So this was a state of Northern Ireland before the revival happened. 
uh, it's the accounts of three ministers. So they've shared about what was happening in their churches before revival hit them. So that same uh, layman's prayer group that happened in New York spread to Ireland. But before it spread to Ireland, this was the state of the church. Uh, so one pastor says, before the revival, our condition was deplorable. We were dead, cold, prayerless, worldly. Two times I tried to start a prayer meeting with elders but failed. The people did not only not want to pray, they were almost hostile towards prayer meetings. They thought we were doing fine and I was unnecessarily disturbing them. So like people were not at all interested in meeting for prayer. Uh, and they were not, not only disinterested in prayer, they were just disinterested in spiritual things, right? Uh, so uh, the problem was not that they were disinterested, was that they thought that everything was okay. This is how the church is supposed to be. Um, then another uh, pastor, another minister says, there seemed great coldness and deadness. I had preached the gospel faithfully, earnestly, and plainly for 11 years, yet it was not known to me that a single individual had been converted. Okay, so 11 years of a very earnest preacher. So it's not that the pastor was failing here. Uh, it was not that he was not doing his job of preaching the gospel. He was doing everything that he needed to do, but not one person was converted in 11 years. Okay, so that's something for us also to consider. Like, um, while we say, look at the fruit of your work, is it bearing, is it having impact, is also like, look at the hearts of the people. You may be doing all that you are called to do, and you may be very faithful to what you're called to do, but it may be that uh, the, yeah, the hearts of people are not yet open and they're not in a place where they are spiritually receptive. Uh, so it's just an amazing testimony of this man's faithfulness in spite of that. Like he didn't give up, uh, he didn't move on to another place. And that's why he was able to uh, also experience the fruit of the revival. So even though he hadn't seen it for these 11 years, his faithfulness to continue doing the work that he was called to then saw fruit uh, when God moved. So yeah. And the last uh, account, the congregation was altogether Laodicean. The spiritual state was depressing and hopeless. So just to say that everyone was basically lukewarm. It was, uh, there was so much cultural Christianity, right? Everyone would call themselves a Christian, but it was just like any other thing uh, you would say about yourself, right? I'm from this place and I'm a Christian. It's just like a description of who you are, nothing else, nothing about what you believe or uh, the state of your heart or anything like that. Um, so what happened when this prayer uh, movement impacted Ireland? So hearing about the revival that was happening in New York, uh, there were there started to be a hunger for revival within Ireland. And uh, specifically among four uh, men, uh, their names are James, James McQuilkin, John Wallace, Robert Carlyle, Jeremiah Minili. And uh, they started to meet for prayer in September 1857 uh, in a place called Ulster. So a large part of what you're looking at on this map is Ulster, which is in North um, island, Northern Ireland. Uh, so they started to meet for prayer. And um, within a little more than a year, so September 1857, they started to meet for prayer. By early 1859, 104 prayer groups had been formed just from that one prayer group of four people. Uh, and these prayer groups were meeting almost all day and all night because they're meeting at different times, meeting around Ireland. Um, by March that same year, uh, there was a prayer meeting that was organized by one of those four people. Um, and uh, his name is James McQuilkin. And as he was having this prayer, so all this time there were these small groups that were meeting, right? So he wanted to do a prayer for all of the people who had been meeting to just do a prayer meeting with everyone. So around 300 people gathered and it was raining. 
and they were in the mud, but they were all there praying. And as they were praying, uh, the Holy Spirit just moved in power. There were about a hundred people that just fell to the ground under conviction of sin as he was, uh, as they were there meeting in prayer. Um, by May that year, so this meeting happened in March. By May, the whole town was affected by this prayer meeting. The Holy Spirit had started to move uh, in the town. People were being saved. There were physical, like like what we talked about, these people falling to the ground under conviction. Uh, other manifestations like that, where people were visibly uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit. And children as well started to join this prayer movement and started uh, to pray powerfully in these movements. Um, from Ulster, it started, so it spread within Ulster, within that whole town, and then started to spread within various counties. So all of these names that you can see there are other counties in Northern Ireland to which the uh, revival spread. By the end of that revival, there were 100,000 people who had joined the church. Um, so there are some just accounts of what happened as this revival spread. Uh, so there was a place called Browshane, uh, where a factory was closed because uh, for two days, 20 of their workers were on the floor of the factory just crying out to God. So they couldn't continue their work. Uh, and they shut down the factory for two days. Uh, in another fair, they were having a country fair, and there were 5,000 people uh, who were present, but that fair itself turned into a prayer meeting. So they were out just in like a carnival type setting, and the whole carnival turned into a prayer meeting because the Holy Spirit moved there. Um, there were families that were restored, there were homes that were changed, there were lives that were changed. Um, there was a place named Belfast. I don't know if that's on your map. Yeah, it is. Uh, Belfast, uh, where they, uh, where one of their breweries, so their alcohol breweries were closed. Uh, people were not drinking. There were no prisoners in custody. So just huge changes, impacts on society. Uh, and what's amazing is that it was just through a simple thing of faithfulness to pray, uh, just among very, very normal, common people, not anyone big, not anyone important, not anyone you know, super gifted or anointed, uh, just people who are willing to pray, gather together, and uh, continue to do that for as long as it took to see God move. Uh, so yeah, just encouraging for us and challenging, I think. <laughs> so uh, from here, from Ireland, the same revival. So what started in New York spread to Ireland, and then from Ireland spread to Wales. Uh, Wales, Scotland, and England. So if you look on your map, that's all this uh, area. Wales is here, Scotland is up here, and England is down there. Uh, so all of these places were impacted by revival. Um, Humphrey Jones uh, had been in America for two years, and so he returned to Wales and uh, just had this burden for people, and uh, so he started to preach. And there was also another Calvinist uh, Methodist, David Morgan. He heard Humphrey preaching, and he started to work with him. So both of them went to Wales, and they were preaching. And through their preaching, um, there was revival that was starting. Uh, people were responding to the gospel. People were being saved. Children were being saved. Uh, and even in the coal mines, there was revival. So there was a lot of coal work that was happening there. So people in their work uh, were being revived. Um, 1860, revival in Scotland and England. Um, so this was all, everything was sparked by the previous thing, right? So from New York, the, the people in Ireland uh, saw what was happening in New York. They wanted to see that happen in Ireland. Um, here, uh, someone from America went to Wales and took what was happening in America, impacted Wales. Uh, so from Wales, now it spreads to Scotland and England because they can see what's happening in their neighboring country. 
and uh, they start to pray for revival. Uh, so 1860, uh, the, the church begins to pray for revival. And um, soon there are 40,000, so this is a very exact number, 40,549 people attending weekly prayers. OK, so a uh, large number of people, 1,205 prayer meetings happening weekly. Uh, and apart from those 1,205 meetings, there are 129 interdenominational meetings. So why is that important? Is that there was unity within the church, which is a big thing that we talk about in revival, uh, that there is increased unity among believers. So although these were from other denominations, uh, and denominations were generally quite divided, at this time they came together to pray for revival. Um, 300,000 people were saved in Scotland and 650,000 people saved in England. Uh, that's huge, huge numbers, right? Of people to be impacted, uh, people to be drawn to Christ. Uh, in this same year, there were reports of revival in other parts of the world. So Jamaica, South Africa, uh, all of these places were impacted uh, by the same revival that kind of spread from uh, from Wales, from Scotland, England, to other parts of the world. So we will stop there um, and continue tomorrow. I think tomorrow will be mostly the presentations. And if we have some time, uh, we'll, we'll continue from there. So um, just a reminder to go back to that sheet and check and make sure you know your right date. So some of you are tomorrow and some of you are next week. Just make sure that you're prepared for your presentation. Thank you.